Well, good morning, Point Church. How y'all doing this morning? Happy, happy New Year's Eve to you. Hopefully you had a great Christmas. As uh, my name is Todd Mullins, I'm on staff here at the Point Church online. Welcome as well. Glad to have you out there. And you know, we got a full house. This is nice. You guys want us to hear what the word Lord's got to say today. As we are starting a new series called Doubting God. It's a three-week series. Next week, we're going to have a panel up here, three or four of us, going to answer questions about doubt. So I'm just excited to get in this. And this was also one of the most difficult sermons that I had to come up with. Because every time I would try to do something, doubt would rise. And I was like, oh, Lord, you're killing me here. I'm trying to get in the Word, trying to get in here, trying to get in there, but just something just kept blocking me. I I started this talk much earlier than I normally would start a talk, but God used it. I'm happy for it, and I'm happy for for the way that we started off this morning. It's a laid back, stripped down version, because oftentimes we try to complicate our faith. We try to complicate God. And so I started to think, what was the first time that I can remember ever doubt came into my life? And it was June of 1977, for you little kids, that's a long time ago, but I had just turned seven a few days before. And it was my dad's weekend to have me and my twin brother, and we were heading down to Bluffton to see my grandparents. We spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And it was just great memories that I have. And on this birthday, this year, 1977, some reason stuck out to me. So we got down there, and my cousin lived right next door, and he was seven days younger than us. So we were kind of like triplets. So we went over and we got our cousin Dean. And so then we were in with our grandparents, talked to them. And my dad's like, hey, guys, come out to the garage. And he opened up the garage door and there were three identical bikes. They were a 1976 Huffy Star Spangler to celebrate, yeah, the bicentennial that the United States had just had the year before. We got these for our seventh birthday. And I was so excited and we're like, yes. And I was like, wait, I don't know how to ride a bike. What's this going to be like? So my dad takes us out to the sidewalk in front of my grandparents' house and he lined us up like jets about to take off an aircraft carrier. And he shoves us one by one with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and just shoves us and takes off. There was no walking alongside. There was no, it was a straight shove. And unlike these majestic jets that would take off to the right or to the left, we would actually go and we'd fall to the right or to the left <laughs> with skin kneecaps and bloody shins and snot and tears and I can't do it. And he would say, Kent never did a darn thing. But that was the first time that I ever remember doubt creeping into my life. It would creep in other times. It was junior year in high school. Two of my buddies are wrestlers. We're heading up to the wrestling coach's house in Lake Wawasee. And he's like, we're going to go uh, skiing, water skiing. I was like, never done it. He's like, oh, it's easy. It's like riding a bike. I was like, yeah, you don't know that story, but I'm going to say it's not that easy. So he said, just lean back like you're on a bike. And when the rope pulls, just let it pull you up. Several face plants into the water. And I was like, this is not happening. But I had doubted what I could do. As I moved further on in life, there were doubts about situations in my life, about getting married too early, about a job opportunity. But doubt was always there in the back of my mind. And with 2024 starting tomorrow in less than 24 hours, we don't know what next year is going to bring. There's always that doubt. You may have doubt of a, of a medical scare in your life or a relationship in your life. There's doubt always there lingering. But what does it say in the Bible about doubt and doubting God? I remember my biggest doubt I ever had I was 32 years old. I was going to go in for spinal fusion, my first ever surgery. And this was one where you were going to be out, out, and they're going to put you under. They're going to do some work for four or five hours and come back out. So I get in there. The anesthesiologist comes in, gets me all hooked up. One of the nurses come in, says, good morning. So I, being polite Todd, I said, good morning to you as well. She said, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to the doctor. And before I could get any word out, I was out. So I went, fell asleep very angry. Um, but I had seen shows 
about out-of-body experiences or people seeing lights or people talking to the Lord or angels or something or and just things that I wanted to see for my life because I hadn't been saved yet. I had not given my life over to the Lord because I was seeking. I was searching for who God was. And so I, this was be a great opportunity for me to have a few words with God and say, hey, who are you? I can ask some questions. I got plenty of time, four or five hours. We'll just sit down at a table, have some coffee and talk. But as soon as I went out was as soon as I came to. There was no lights. There was no deep voice. There was no God. And I said, is there a God? Is there a God? Doubting God. Today we're going to talk about some helpful hints when it arises in your life. First, Jesus, he's going out for a breakfast walk. He's got his disciples with him. He sees a fig tree and he walks over to it to get a fig. There's nothing on there. So he curses the fig tree and it withers and dies. And his disciples are like, what just happened here? And he says to them, he says, Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what has, was done to this fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. How many of you guys have seen mountains jump into the sea? No? So, so is Jesus saying here that you can't have doubt? Mm -mm. I think he's saying, boys, boys, you can do this and you can tell a mountain to go throw itself into the sea if you don't doubt. So I've never heard a news story about Pikes Peak jumping into the Gulf of Mexico. I've never heard about Count, Mount Kilimanjaro jumping into the ocean or Mount Everest jumping into the ocean. I've actually prayed in El Salvador looking at a mountain to jump into the ocean with no doubt and it doesn't do it because then doubt creeps in and says, will it really? Jesus is telling these guys, look, you're going to have doubt. You're going to have doubt. If you don't, which I know you're going to, because that's why I've made you. No, doubt was introduced to us way back when, when the snake said, hey, I don't think he really meant that, did he? And Eve's like, well, you're right. Maybe not. We're going to have doubt. Jesus says it right there. He says, if you believe and don't have doubt, that mountain can go into the ocean, but it's not going to because you've got doubt. So what are three things that we can have? We have three hints that can help us with our doubt. It says, first, doubt is natural. Doubt is natural. Genesis 41.1 says, when two, year, two full years had passed, Joseph, when two full years have passed, he's sitting in prison still. Remember what he did with the cupbearer and the baker? They, heard, they told him his dreams. And he said, oh, yeah, you're going to be restored. You're going to be hung. And it came true. But he said, before you leave, hey, remember me. Tell the king so I can get out of here. But for two years, he sat in there. You don't think he had doubts? You've probably been waiting for an answer to prayer for two or three or four or five, six years. And you've had doubts. Because it's natural. Doubt is natural. Doubt is the evidence of faith, not the lack of faith. Disobedience is a lack of faith. Doubt is the evidence of faith. So if you have doubt, it's natural. Matthew 11, two through three says, when John, John the Baptist, John the Baptist who said, hey, I can't even carry the sandals of the one that I'm preparing the way for. I can't even carry his sandals. And he heard about Jesus doing all these things. He saw Jesus while doing baptisms. He knew who Jesus was, yet he had doubts. It says, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? John the Baptist, if John the Baptist got doubts, I can have doubts. You can have doubts. Because Jesus even said John the Baptist, there's no, no one like that man. In Mark 4, 39 through 40, says he got up, this is Jesus, he got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you still have doubts? Do you still have questions? It's natural. It's natural. Mark 3, 20 through 21 says, then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. It's too packed to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. His own family says he's out of his mind. 
James, the brother of Jesus, said he's a lunatic. They had doubts. His own family had doubts. John the Baptist had doubts. Joseph in prison had doubts. Doubt is natural. I had doubts when I came too. Does God exist? Is God real? What's, what's going on? Why have my prayers not been answered? You know, I, I, a friend of mine, and I've told you before, we, we get together and we pray at 4.30 on Tuesday. 4.30 on Tuesday, bless you. 4.30 on Tuesday. We pray about the situation in our life, about what's going on, and we haven't had answers to those prayers. But we know that God's working, as we just heard a sermon last week about God doing work and being patient. And we know. But yet, I still have doubts. They still pop up every once in a while. When he's telling me about what's going on in his life, I'm telling him what's going on in my life with my twin brother. I still have doubts. I reached out to his wife for Christmas. I said, Merry Christmas to you and Troy and the kids. And she said, tell everybody over there, Merry Christmas. There's hope, but I have doubts. I have doubts that I'll ever see my brother again. And I know my friend has doubts that he may never see his son again. But we pray and we hold on because doubt is natural. Doubt is natural. If you have doubts, it's evidence of faith, not the lack of faith. So don't beat yourself up. Doubt is natural too. Get answers to your doubt. 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for your hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Always get answers and always be willing and able to give answers to why you believe what you believe. And do it with gentleness. Because if you have doubts, ask questions. If you have doubts. Hello? All right. If you have doubts, ask questions. Ask questions. I've got a sister-in-law who's struggling. She's got questions just about what's going on in her life and the God and relationship she has with her, with his, with her, her God, the Father. Is this thing on? I'm just going to shut this off, Carl. We'll be good. All right. So a month ago, I was like, hey, I know that you struggle with a relationship with God. I, I know you struggle with who God is. Can you give me any of your doubts? Because I would love to understand where you're coming from. I've had those doubts at an earlier age. And she said, yes. And she sent me one. She said, Todd, I struggle with Noah. Noah and the ark and the mighty flood. If everybody came from just that small group of people, why are we not all one language? Why are we not all one religion? Why are we all not the same? Why? And I thought, great question great question. And I started to think about it and I just started to pray and say, God, how do I answer this? You know, I can just give the typical, well, you just got to believe. Just take that doubt and throw it away. There's no doubt is natural. And so I started to think, I started to pray, I started to listen. And God revealed to me, he's like, talk to her about the Mayflower. I was like, hey, the Mayflower. So I looked it up and I, there were 102 people that came over on the Mayflower. And today there are 35 million living descendants of the Mayflower. There are 10 million living descendants of the Mayflower here in the United States. My wife and I did an Ancestry.com and her and I are both descendants of the Mayflower. We didn't come over after, we came over on the Mayflower. And so I told her, I said, look, out of the 102, there are 35 million people living in the world, the descendants, 10 million here. I said, and out of the 10 million here, even the 35 million all over the world, we all speak different languages. We all have different religions. We all have different tastes in music, in food, in how we raise our kids. Likewise, as we get further and further away from the flood and there's more and more population, that's going to change. People have freedom of will to choose. So through that, I was able to give her that answer. And she said, next question. How can we find then things that are dated before the flood if it wiped everything out? Hmm, good question. I began to think and to pray. And for some reason, God gave me this analogy. He's like, okay, this is a system set up by humans that are fallible. We say that this thing is that many years old because that's what we think that should say. 
So if I'm walking through the woods and I find a pair of jeans, don't know why I came up with this, have no clue, that's just my brain, don't know why some of these jeans would be in the woods. And I find these jeans and I pick them up, I say, oh, these are Lee jeans. I can give you maybe the kind of year, maybe 10 or so years that they might have been made, but I can't give you the exact date and what factory they were made at. So I told her that. I was like, look, we say that this thing is that many years old. We do not know for sure. There's always that doubt of what it is. And she sent me another question. She said, hey, I've got another one that just came up a couple days ago. Would you like to hear that or do you have enough? I said, no, I'd love to hear it. She says she has a friend who was going to school to be a pastor. And so tragedy struck his family. And in his junior year, he left school. His mother was diagnosed with cancer and it took her very quickly. And as he got to see her last breath leave her body, he said he then realized there was no such thing as God. There was no higher power. If there were, why would he take her? And I thought, wow, I can't just send back a thumbs up on this one. I need to think about this. So I talked about in my head with God, I prayed. I was like, how do I answer this? And I said, first, sorry to hear that your friend has lost his mother. I would never wish that upon anybody. Cancer is a vicious thing. It's a disease of this world that we have to endure. I said, I unfortunately have been in his shoes as I too saw my father pass away from cancer. It took him rather quickly. And as I saw his last breath, I was not angry. I was happy. And because I was happy was because a month before my father and I were at a doctor's appointment. And he began to cry as the doctor said, you're going to die and you'll die quickly if you don't do this. And my dad said, I am not doing that. As the doctor left him in the room with my stepmom and I, and my stepmom was talking to the doctor as they were, he was walking out, my dad began to cry and I said, dad, what's wrong? And he said, I'm scared, son. And to hear a father say that to a son, it's so hard because we look at our parents as unbreakable. We look at our dads as the strongest man in the world, the smartest man in the world. Growing up, you look up to your dad, you're like, man, I saw him walk through icy water as he would trap in the wintertime to provide some money for Christmas gifts and what he would do just to pull the things out of traps and do things it's like that is my dad. But for him to say he's scared, I was like, oh, dad, what are you scared about? He's like, I'm scared where I'm going, son. I don't know where I'm going. I said, oh, yeah. can I share with you the gospel and what Jesus has done for you? He said, yeah. I shared with him and we prayed and I told him, I said, that there's no, the prayer is not salvation, but it's understanding what Jesus did. And I'm typing all of this to my sister-in-law that Jesus died on the cross that Jesus paid the price that he shouldn't have to, that we could never pay. And my dad accepted Jesus that day. And I knew, thank you, I knew when his last breath left his body that immediately he was ushered into the arms of Jesus Christ, into a loving father, into a new body where the cancer could never get him. And I told her, I said, your friend says his mother was a believer. He too must believe that she is in the arms of Jesus Christ. I said, I will not discount his doubt because I have been there. I have been there, but I will not discount his doubt. I said, I'm glad he has doubt because doubt is the evidence of faith. Disobedience is the evidence of lack of faith. But doubt is the evidence of faith. If you have questions, ask the questions. Get answers to your questions. Doubt is natural. And give a reason for why you believe. Get the answers to your questions. And thirdly, Talk to others who've had doubt. Talk to others who've had doubt. Hear their testimonies. Psalm 66, 16 says, Come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he's done for me. 
what he has done for me. Last service, before the service started, there was a young lady struggling. She was crying. She was in tears. I'm like, what's wrong? I sat down with her next to her on the, on the chair, and I put my arm around her. I said, what is wrong? She says, I have to move to Arizona to take care of my mother, who's 93. I said, oh, we're going to miss you. We're going to miss you. I'll hug you. I'll just pray with you right now. And she said, but my husband of 33 years just told me he no longer wants to be with me. He doesn't want me anymore. And that's why she was crying. She doesn't feel wanted. And I said, I know who loves you. And that's God the Father. I said, let me tell you. I said, my first wife told me that my touch repulsed her. That I was, she never wanted to be with me again. And she wanted a divorce. I've been in your shoes. It hurts. It hurts. You will get through this. Focus on God. And she gave me a hug. And she cried. I was able to tell her story in first service. And I looked at her when I said that God loves you. God loves you. When you have doubts, God loves you. He wants to answer those. He wants to answer those questions. That's natural. Talk to others who've had issues that you may be going through. I got another gentleman in the first service. He's got cancer. He's got cancer. He's, he knows he's going to die. And you would never know it because he's so happy. He's like, my daddy's got me. I've had my doubts. My daddy's got me. You could talk to him out in the lobby and he will say nothing but good things. He'll never rebuke God. He'll be like, I've got cancer, and if he wants to take it from me here, good. If he doesn't want to, he's going to take it away when I'm in heaven. My daddy's got me. Talk to others who've been in your shoes. Get into a grow group. This isn't a plug for a grow group, but you're going to hear testimonies in those grow groups. I've done grow groups. I've got life friends that we do things together that help me when I have doubts. When I'm struggling, I can reach out to them. You too can join a small group and reach out to those people when you're going through things to get answers, when you want to hear testimonies. There was another young lady here at church. I got a, I got, we got, I got a family here, y'all. You guys are family to me. And she, I've known her for six years. One day I was doing ministry and my what up ministry and Pastor Ray called me, he goes, where are you at? I told him, he says, hey, can you stop over here at this address? I said, yep, yeah, on my way. I rolled up and I saw it was her. I gave her a hug. I said, what's going on? She said, my husband just passed away. I was able to be with her. She started telling me about her sons and one that's always in and out of jail, one that goes missing for six months and not once does she ever get mad at God. When we talk, she cries. She says, I don't know where he's at, but just pray for him. And I do. And then she'll say, next time I see her, hey, they found him. He's in Michigan. He's at a halfway house. He's doing well. Great. The next time I see her, oh, he's back here. He's in jail. I'm like, great. He's getting, he can't do any more drugs. She's like, amen. He cannot. And she will not rebuke God. I said, you are a testimony. I love to hear you inspire me. She says, why do I inspire you? You guys inspire me. I was like, oh, no, no, no. To hear where you're at in your faith, when doubt comes up, you know doubt is natural. You're getting answers to your questions. And you talk to others. You give us your testimony that may help me. When I hear other people going through things that I can relate to, I want to talk to them and let them know, hey, it's great. You're going to get through this. If I'm in a situation, I want to talk to other people that say, hey, I've been there. Your doubt is natural. I don't ever want to tell anybody, take that doubt and throw it away. You take that doubt. Oftentimes, we'll put our faith in our faith, not our faith in Jesus Christ who did everything. And Jesus says, look, it's natural. It's natural. Now, doubt is natural. So doubt is natural. Get answers to your questions. And I want to leave you with a prayer. Mark 9, 24. A man comes to Jesus and he needs help with healing. And Jesus says, do you believe? Because if you believe, it's done. And he says, I do believe. And it could just stop right there. He says, I do believe, but it could just stop right there, but it doesn't. It says, help me overcome my unbelief. Now, why would he say that? He says, I do believe. But help me overcome my unbelief. Help me overcome my doubt because doubt is natural. Even to this man who's speaking to Jesus, says, I do believe. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Help me overcome my unbelief. Look, faith is not perfect. 
And Jesus is stronger than any doubt you got. Just give it to him. Doubt is natural. Get questions and give answers to your questions. And share your testimonies and listen to testimonies. Let's pray. Father God. Ooh, Father God, thank you. I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. Father, when doubt arises, may I give it to you. Doubt is natural. You tell us that doubt is natural. If it weren't, we'd see mountains jumping into the oceans. I've tried it, Lord. I've tried to make a mountain jump into the ocean, and that's, that just comes right back, that doubt. There may be those here that have doubt about a health coming up, a health scare, a, a job, a relationship. They have doubts. They're doubting you, God, because it's not happening in their time. And I pray, Lord, that they would understand that first, that doubt is natural. Let that not be a wedge between you and God. Doubt is natural. Satan's going to say, doubt's not natural. That means you don't believe. No. Doubt is the evidence of faith. Disobedience is the evidence of no faith. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. It all starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that's you today, you've been doubting that, start it today. If you think you got to clean your life up first, you don't. You don't, you can't. I've tried that. It doesn't work. April 16, 2006 was a day that I threw my doubt to God and I said, God, I don't know anymore what to do. And he said, I got you, Todd. I'm going to come into your life. I'm going to start working. You're going to see. So any doubt you've got, bring it to me. Bring it to the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I know you died on the cross. I know you conquered that grave. There's no doubt in my mind that you conquered that grave for me to get away to the Father. For me to get away to the Father. I thank you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Just need to stop and invite Christ in. Let the Holy Spirit take residence in you. Doubt is natural. Get the answers to your questions and listen to testimonies and give yours. Jesus, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. It's in Jesus' mighty, powerful, and effective name that we pray. Amen. Hey there. Thank you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye.